Oh, here's another episode. We're with Brennan. Go again. Again. For another episode of Flight Tales. Dang it. I was trying to match. Ah, <laughs> we were talking about before the camera rolled. Yeah. About how you were a uh, cop and in the Marines. But I think in your podcast, we didn't get much detail on all that. No, you were a, you were a full cop? Yeah, full cop. I didn't know that. Yeah, full, full cop. cop. Like yeah, the guy full that would give deal, you gun yeah. on the gun on the, and then a whole badge. You yeah, know, he that was thing. a traffic cop. He gave tickets when you ran the red stop sign, of red course. light, whatever. Yeah, and you know you want to just yeah, you if just you were, wanted. Uh, to... If you got pulled over, you were getting a ticket. No, I wasn't that guy. Oh no. man, <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't like to give tickets. I pulled over a lot of people, but I'd always give the warnings. And I, some cops don't like that. Some cops think if you should if you pull somebody over, you should get a you ticket. Should give they they think that if you're pulling somebody over, it, you know I wouldn't have pulled you over if it wasn't a good enough reason to give you a ticket. Right. I wasn't. I didn't work for the city. I actually worked for the university, the Nichols University. Oh, you were a yep. university cop. Yep. They. Uh, so I you was, weren't a real cop. Don't yeah. say that. <laughs> don't yeah, say that. That's what we think about them UL cops. Don't you know? say that. <laughs> No, so actually, university cops have, uh, like, police cops, like city cops, usually have their their um, their commission card signed by like the mayor. But for university cops, you get it signed by the um, the governor. So you're basically oh, you're that sounds like you, almost a state trooper. Like you, yes, you essentially. So a state trooper has they can do what they want over the state of Louisiana. So essentially, a, a university cop can do the same thing. Okay. Because you work for the state yeah. instead of being a city cop. You don't work for a parish or anything like We're that. We're learning all kinds of stuff. Yeah, so yeah. you- I'm uh, sorry I offended you. No, I, I get it. <laughs> it's fine. Everybody <laughs> thinks that. We deal with a lot of different stuff, though, compared to like what a city cop would or a state cop would or a sheriff's office would. Well, your yeah. jurisdiction, though, is the campus, yeah. not outside the campus. You don't do anything well, you can do. You can do stuff outside the oh. campus for sure. We don't want to do stuff outside yeah. of the campus because that's like if you're going outside of the campus, you're taken away from your job, which is to protect the campus. That's a big part of the job is to make sure students feel safe because, you know, there are a bunch of kids. Their parents are sending their kids off places that yeah. they don't know. I guess if y'all were over overwhelmed, y'all could call the city police. Mm -hmm. Because y'all are inside, yeah. Nichols is inside Thibodeau, right? Yeah. yeah. So like so. a big thing with us was like having good relationships with Thibodeau police yeah. because we call them out all the time to help us like we didn't have dogs so like if we had drug stuff going on we called Thibodeau and we say hey can we get one of the canine units out to help us out or if we are arresting somebody and we had trouble they would come help us and it's kind of crazy too because you would think like police departments are like oh they're police they're brothers no matter what but like it really is like sometimes Certain police departments don't have good relationships with other police departments, so they don't want to help you kind of thing. It was kind of like an unwritten rule, like for police officers, if you're driving around and you see a police officer officer pulled over with another person, you should stop too. Yeah. Just to help him have out. Have backup. Yeah, yeah. You should stop to help him out. And some police officers, like if you don't have a good relationship with them, they probably won't. If you do, you know, they'll usually, they'll usually um, pull up and kind of. Make sure you're okay. Or they'll drive by and they'll they'll do this, which is code four. Code four just means like, yep, we're good. Oh, we're yep. good. Okay. So if they if they do that to you, they'll they'll look at you and they'll give you a thumbs up. Yeah. They'll basically say, Yeah, we're good. No, yeah. keep on driving. Okay. But most times if you have good relationships with them, they'll they'll check up on you and they'll help you out where they can. So we had good relationships. So you said you would give warnings most yeah, of the time. Most of the time. So what would make you not give a warning? If this person has a bad attitude, they obviously don't like the cops. So me giving them a ticket isn't going to help that oh, whatsoever. Oh, yeah, to make it worse. Yeah, isn't going to help their attitude towards the cops. They're just going to hate the cops even more because they're going to go back and like, oh, this cop was a, a whatever to me and whatnot. Yeah. And But then you could also be the guy that gives them a positive outlook where they're like, Oh, I had this. I thought I was going to have this really bad experience when I got pulled over, but it ended up being really good. This guy gave me a break, even though I was acting a complete, yeah, you know, in this situation. I actually had a lady tell me 
give me a hug and she posted me on facebook one time because oh, like, really because she was bad like she was like uh doing all kind of stuff like call me anything you could call me oh all the cuss words yeah anything and i was like i i went up to the window i wrote down all her stuff and whatnot and i went up to the window i was like hey can you step out and she was like oh hell no i ain't stepping out i'm not stepping out with you i was like you're not getting a ticket and she was like really <laughs> and she, she was like i was like yes i'm just trying to talk to you and so she got out and she started talking to me and she was like i've never had that happen to me i was like hopefully this makes you not do it anymore because yeah. you know we're not trying we're not out to get you yeah. kind of thing like to me if like on campus you're not supposed to be going fast like it, it's 25 like the yeah. whole way around the campus and it's 45 on the outsides if you're going 50 on campus through campus yeah yeah through campus like well that's dangerous because you could run over someone. well and that's the point is like I, I can't I mean, help you anymore. There's, like, there's people crossing the road all the yeah, time. Yeah. And that's why it's 25. Like, it's a college. People are always walking around crossing the street. If you're going 50, that's enough to kill somebody. 25, probably going to hurt somebody. 50, you're probably going to kill somebody. So, like, I probably got to write you a ticket. Like, I can't get away with, like, oh, I pulled this guy good for going 25 miles over, and I didn't give him a ticket. They'd be like, why? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So... But most of the time, it was just warnings. It was just, you know, I don't want to be the guy that pulls. So did, did you do that right after high school, after you graduated high school? I went to the Marine Corps first. So Marines first. Okay. Yeah, I went to college for a little bit, played baseball a little bit. But then after, I was like, I don't want to, you know, like, I'm not going to the MLB. So let me start my life. And then I was getting into, like, I, I wanted to go the federal route. So the federal route, if you go, like, FBI or anything like that, they usually want to see – you know, some law enforcement background. You're either super smart or you're ex-military. That's what oh, okay. I've gathered from the FBI. Is like super smart ex-military. So I went. I went the military route. I was going to go to the Marine Corps. I was going to be an officer in the Marine have been Corps. The super smart. No, I'm not super <laughs> smart. <laughs> I'm not super smart. Yeah, <laughs> definitely not super smart. No, I'm dumb. <laughs> I'm dumb. Yeah. I went the dumb route. <laughs> I went the dumb like I lift weights route. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I went that route. I went to the military. I was going to be like an, an officer in the Marines. That ended up not being what I wanted to do. So I just went into the reserves and I was a anti, anti-tank anti missile man. So an O three fifty two. So officer, well, officer, usually like if you graduate college, you mm-hmm. automatically go to officer yep. school. Time so out. that was my Time out. No, he just said he's an anti-tank military man. Missile man. Missile man. <laughs> And you're just going to pass that right up? We're going to get back to it. We're going to get there. <laughs> <laughs> you can't well, just was, leave that on the well, table. I mean, like he that. said officer, so I wanted to. But that was the plan, though, originally. Yeah. was like, go go to the military. I wasn't done with college yet. Yeah, okay. <laughs> go to the military. Come back after the military. Go to college. Finish college in the reserves. They have this thing. It's called a PLC. Like You go basically to, to boot camp for officers in the summer of you going to school. Oh, okay. So like I was going to do that. And then by the time I finished school, I'd be an officer and I'd be in the military. I'd have my own job. Um, I ended up not wanting to do that, be an officer in the military. So I was just like, I'm going to do the reserves. I'm going to work and in law gonna enforcement. I'm going to be an anti-military. Oh no. Anti-tank. anti-tank missileman. Missileman. Yeah. Yep. Anti-tank missileman. Yeah. So you're shooting the missiles to yep. the tanks. Yep. When I was in Lafayette. That sounds fun. It was pretty cool. When I was in Lafayette, we had got to practice somewhere. Anti, anti tank missileman. Yep. It's so are you got a, like a bazooka gun or whatever? Like oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> rocket launcher, bro. Rocket, rocket launcher, heart. bazooka. It's not a rocket. It's a missile. <laughs> it's a rocket launcher. If you rocket. ever, if you ever talk to, you ever play 007? That's a rocket launcher. <laughs> that's right. If you ever talk to anti tank missileman, that that's like they hate uh, that. That's the first. It's not a rocket. It's a missile. Yeah. I was about to say, you literally just said yeah. missile men. Yeah, it's not a rocket, it's a missile. But So we we either shot a tow missile through a saber system uh, or a javelin, which is pretty cool. I'll explain. I've heard of that. Oh. I've played Modern Warfare. Javelins are freaking badass. That's crazy so that you shot that. So what it does that. is <laughs> you, you hold it on your shoulder and you, you look into the, into the little thermal imagery and then you put a box around your target and it basically... 
what it does is it it shoots the missile it locks onto it and it goes straight up in the air and the dome of the javelin is constantly trying to to form a 3d picture of the above version of that target so when it identifies the target it goes straight down so, so it goes see, up until it yep, identifies it, yep. and then it's like, got it. You'll see a javelin. God, that I'm, is really I'm cool. Not a, I'm not a super professional on it, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. So it shoots out. You'll see it. It, it like, it kind of like someone just goes boom and kicks the missile out of the tube at first, and then it goes and it shoots up. And then once it gets up there, you'll see it. Like it's not like a oh, it's like a. It's like, I found yeah, it. <laughs> yes. And it's freaking insane. It's cool. The other one we shoot is pretty cool too. This is the one I, I worked on a lot. It's called a tow missile and it's, it's the best optic that the Marine Corps has. It can go like times 64. So it's a times it's an, 64. What? Like vision. Like it can zoom in times oh. 64. Yeah. And, uh, so what you do is it's thermal imagery and you, you pick out your target and you have these crosshairs. Are you looking at a screen or through like a yep, scope through screen? A screen? Yep. So you're looking at through a screen, like these little goggles, and then you put your crosshairs on the target. And when you shoot it, it basically comes out. It's a wire guided missile. So basically whatever you do with your crosshairs, the, the missile follows. So, that is cool. So if you if you have a moving target yeah. target, you keep the crosshairs on the target the entire time, and the missile just kind of follows it. It's crazy. It's great. I've shot. So we went to to California and did a big exercise, and we shot like uh, seven of them. And that was when I was on. I was a vehicle commander for an LAV. That's the vehicles with like four tires on both sides. The amphibious. Ours was electronic where it was like this the vehicle big, was yeah it was a big pull up a picture of it and and i'll actually i'll send you a picture of me on it yes and um it's like a big mechanical thing and the gunner sits underneath it like inside the vehicle and he controls where it goes so it, it goes full 360 degrees and my job was to basically i'm on top well, my head's sticking out. I'm commanding the vehicle. So like I'm talking to people on the radio, telling them where to go, you know, like, cause so it's the not, driver can't see where you're going. The driver can, but I'm telling them where to go. Like I'm saying, like, I'm oh, talking like, to hey, that tree over there, go that way. Like our platoon thing. commander is coordinating everything that's going on. And you're the so hub like, of it. Yeah. And a, he's saying like, you know, whatever your call sign is like green six, do this. And I'd tell them to do it and whatnot. And the other job part of it is like identifying targets. So like I'm identifying a target. That's why I'm really good at pointing out traffic to other people. Cause oh. like I'll tell them a big thing with like identifying targets is like find landmarks that are distinguishable and then go from that landmark to try and identify targets. So I'd be like, Oh, you see that big water tower. If you go three fingers to the right and you look about at it's 11 o'clock, that's where the traffic is. Oh yeah. So it's, that sounds like a military. Yeah. Thing. So that's, it's, it's a big, yeah. You know, that was my job is to identify targets for, um, and it's a little bit different when he's sitting on the screen, but is identifying the target for him to and then engage he aims for the target. Yeah. Okay. And then we, we, we shoot, I have some videos of it, but there, um, it is insane. It's yeah, pretty cool. That sounds cool. When I was in California, we shot like seven or eight of them or whatnot. I got to shoot one. My gunner got to shoot like five and like the other people got to shoot my, so it's a, a driver your vehicle commander, the gunner, and then there's a, a loader. The loader is usually the most junior Marine. Oh, like it, I, I thought you were going to say the strongest, but dumbest. No, it's the most junior. It's the job where like you're trying to learn everything, you know, you don't really know what's going on. Like you just got here, but like we can teach you how to do this yeah. real and, quick. Yeah. yeah. And so you do that. And it's the too. safest end of it. Mm -hmm. You usually got about four people in the vehicle for a LAV at least. Um, but it's pretty fun. It How long is, were you there in the in the Marines? I was in for six years. Okay. Yeah, a reserve contract is for six years. So did that so, for six well, years. So when you were a cop, though, you were still in the Marines. I was a full time cop, okay. and then I'd reserve. Go, you were in the yeah, reserve. I'd yeah. go once a month in the reserves to to do training and whatever they need us to do. But it was it was fun. I liked. 
the reserves. Uh, I'm glad I didn't go active because I definitely wouldn't have liked that. And then I ended up marrying an active duty Marine, yeah. which I got. Oh, the really? Part, yeah, I got the part that I was trying to avoid, which was getting moved around. Yeah. And then we got moved around. <laughs> I married her and then we got moved to D.C. So <laughs> it gave me really good qualities that I wouldn't have had if I didn't go to the Marine Corps. And it's like, you know, it could be worse kind of mentality yeah. like it could be worse We're, we'll we'll deal with what we got and we'll make it work kind of thing that's helped me just pushing through some stuff that's not so easy sometimes you know yeah. so probably why focused. yeah it's probably why i was able to get this done so fast is because laser laser, laser focus, focus. yeah <laughs> jinx yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah so you were a cop at the university yep. and in the marines and then you, you said because you were going wanted to try to go to the federal route, and you had decided obviously you didn't do that because you're here flying airplanes. Yeah, I didn't do that. Well, when we got moved to D.C., I had been getting into real estate, like wanting to invest in real estate and whatnot, and I was just going to be a police officer and do that too. But when we moved to D.C., I went to go apply for a sheriff's office there, and they were like, "Well." Uh, our stuff doesn't correlate with Louisiana, so you would have to go through a six-month police academy again. And I just went through a Marine Corps boot camp in the last three years. I just went through a police academy in the last two years. I'm not going through another one. So I was just like, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'll pass. So would you I, have to? Would you have to do that with the FBI or or probably yeah? They yeah, probably have probably. their own little thing. But that's okay. I'd rather do that's that. That's a little more, but. Yeah, you got a little... Yeah. It might be a little bit different. Yeah. And I'd rather do that, and, you know, that would be down the road, and then I'd have some time to recoup from all this, but it was like another police academy right away, and I was like, eh. So I just was like, okay, if I'm not doing this, I need I, I want to invest in real estate, I'll get into something that can help me learn about real estate, and I was like, I'll be a real estate agent. It was either like get into construction, like get into some sort of construction so I can learn how to like rehab houses on my own pretty well, which I have family that does that. So I already kind of knew it where I was going to go to the appraisal route. Like I was going to be an appraiser to where I can learn how to value homes. And that way, like I can make good uh, decisions as far as doing it. But real estate's just a little bit of all of it. Like if you're a real estate agent, you kind of wear a little bit of each hat. Got to like, know enough about each thing to at yeah. least explain it to somebody. Yeah. And that's kind of where I was, was like, okay, that's going to probably help me the most. You're essentially just a manager of the transaction. Like that's what you're doing. You're helping someone find that house. And then once you find that house, you're a manager of what's going on, of everything that's going on. Yeah. So, you know, I learned a lot about it. And eventually whenever I get to a good spot, I'll probably continue to do what i planned on doing but uh being a pilot costs a lot of money yes. so <laughs> yes <laughs> so uh we uh we, we're gonna put that on hold for a little bit but eventually we'll get back to it so we'll see that's my life now time for some cockpit comedy you go first okay well i got a long joke Let's see my long joke hold on all right so uh, my joke is Two Ohio State fans are flying into an airport. Pilot looks out and says, looks like we've got a pretty short runway here. Give me a quarter of flaps. Co-pilot drops in a quarter of flaps. Closer in, pilot says, that runway is a short one. Give me half flaps. Co-pilot notches in half flaps. Just about at threshold, pilot exclaims, man, this is a really short runway. Give me three quarter flaps. Co-pilot dials it in. Right over threshold, the pilot yells out, I need full flaps now. Co-pilot quickly dumps in all the flaps, airplane shutters, and pancakes onto the runway. As the dust is settling and the two pilots are getting their wits back together, pilot says, man, that has to be the shortest runway I've ever landed on. Co-pilot says, yeah, but look how wide it is. Who built an airplane that couldn't fly? The wrong brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, that was a good one. ATC, Cessna, what are your intentions? Cessna, to get my commercial pilot's license and instrument rating. ATC, I meant the next five minutes, not years. <laughs> <laughs> ah. 
Got him. There's an ATC one. Why was the little airplane sent back to his hangar? Because he had a bad attitude. Uh, and now for the runway report. We didn't really think about what happened lately. I mean, a lot's happened. We're, we're flying a ton. Uh, as always. Yeah. As always. And... We've Working had a few stuff. people uh, solo and uh, get their check ride done. And yeah, we're working. You're working Cirrus on the Cirrus stuff in this Cirrus right here. That, yep, that one. That one. Yeah. So you'll be a Cirrus training instructor. Yeah. It seems like a lot more people are starting to fly it now that um, we've Yeah, become... more people are flying the Cirrus now. Yeah. It's a good Getting time. Getting busier. Yeah. It's a nice airplane. It is very nice. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to... Uh, do some teaching. In it. It's got air conditioning. Yes. <laughs> Enjoy my time flying. You don't have to sweat. Sweating yeah. bullets. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, flying that a good bit, getting that all done. I, um, no, nothing big has happened. I mean. We, we got just, the rocking on the runway uh, uh, dinner coming up thing. Isn't oh, yeah, up? that's right. They're, they're about to uh, issue the check or say how much they made. Yeah, I'm excited to see that. Yeah. That's going to be, since it's sold out, I can only imagine oh, how, how much, much. money. Oh. Yeah, I don't remember. I I want to say last year was like $160,000, uh, but I don't know. I can't remember. I'm thinking 200000 this year. Regardless, yeah. 160000 is a lot of money. Yep, a ton, like ton of money. Just donate to charity. Yeah. That's pretty good, though. Yep, I'm sure the school can use that. The um, Yeah. Ain't Mary it's a good cause. Yeah. Go to Rockin' on the Runway every year. Buy tickets. Yeah, I think next year, I mean, I'm sure they've got the uh, parking situation figured out because that was the problem. Yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah. Um, what else? As far as the school goes, I mean, we just rolling. We just getting it. Getting some people done. We're getting, getting busy. We, we, we busy. Everybody's getting their hours. Yep. I mean, how many hours you got? I, I mean, I think you and John got 100 hours last month. Probably Maybe the last few months. From, I don't know. Yep. Right. I'm about to be at 700 today probably. Yeah. Oh, man. Mm. Just started in February. Yeah. What'd you start with? 260. 260? Yeah. Golly. Yeah. So we're moving. We're flying a lot. That's the thing. Like, I don't even realize. I mean, I know we're flying a lot. I see it on the schedule. And then I'm flying it. a lot too, you know? Yep. You don't realize it until you start looking back. You're like, geez. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to have the multi come back a little bit. and Yeah, that's right. You're going to do your MEI? Yeah. Yeah. Will's going to get his. And then Will's going to do his multi? Yep. Yeah. That's going to be fun. Yeah. And then don't know how that's going to work if we have a multi eventually, but yeah. that would be really cool. I don't know. <laughs> Be really cool. Well, we're getting more people coming in, though. Well, and then some of the guys are commercial rating, and so they got to get their, you know. TAA. I, TAA, so, uh, which stands for Technically Advanced Aircraft Time. Yeah. So they are starting to fly the Cirrus because of that, and they have to get 10 hours before they get their commercial. Yep. In a TAA. So yeah. they're flying the Cirrus a good bit. Yeah. So that's Chris, Fernando, Brant. Um, yeah. All those people are flying in it. Yeah. But we're also getting more people. Like I, you know, did a discovery flight in the Cirrus the other last weekend, and that guy, you know, is considering getting getting his pilot's license and getting a Cirrus and. Nice. But it's a business transaction though too. Like it's he's not doing it just for fun. He's trying to look at it as business. This is just a me question. How high is the average thunderstorm? Well, um, I mean, if you, they're in the an 30s. An intricate question. Yeah, it's, it is an intricate, because some, I mean, very powerful storms can get up to 60,000 feet. Okay. What planes can get over that? Nothing. Gotcha. The U-2. Spy plane. The space yeah. plane. Yeah. yeah. The shuttle. Yeah. Uh, You're not. But I mean, if you, you can know, some airplanes get over some storms? Yeah. So, like, that's really my question. Um, some planes can go up to, you know, their max altitude is 51,000 feet. So, you can, in that type of plane, you can get up to like 47. You're above almost everything, unless it's one of those 60,000 foot. But even that, like that storm, you'll be able to see it and you can go around it. 
I got, you know, it's easier going, to go around it. It's than easier you, to go around it. You're traveling so fast. It's not going to be that much time difference or that much distance. Is there any storm low enough that, a, that in a Cirrus you'd be like, I'm just going to go over it? Or 99.999% of the time you're going to go around it? Probably going to go around yeah, it. Yeah, you're going to go around it. I mean, uh, like the stuff you encounter, like in a, if you get an SR-22T, it can go up to like 20,000. And... So, like, in the summer, if you leave in the morning before the storms start, uh, you'll be way above that kind of stuff. You know, there Already. might be. Yeah. Yeah. And then as the day goes on, usually those clouds start building up. But if you can get to 20,000, you'll be over all that stuff. I got you. That's kind of cool. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know what made me think of that, but I, I, most I was normal, excited about this question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> most normal thunderstorms. Yeah. You get over. Yeah. Let's get some pre-solo advice. I know. Uh, looking outside during storms. Oh, yeah. You got to look outside. Don't look at the ball. <laughs> look outside because the nose is going to tell you where it's going. Yeah. Tell you everybody know? about 75% outside, 25% inside. Yeah. Looking outside and you're just kind of verifying with your instruments, making yeah. sure everything's where it's supposed to be. Yeah. Don't be staring. Don't yeah. be staring at the ball down here in the left corner. Yeah. And then, you know. What's a storm? So, is a stall? A stall is when a plane stops producing lift, essentially. It's not when your engine quits. It's when it's an aerodynamic mm-hmm. stall. Can't go up anymore. Yes. Yeah. So you're. Do you start going down? You do, because <laughs> there's no more lift being created. Yeah. So you. Start so you look going outside down. to make sure you're not going straight down. Well, no. It's the the point of a so when you're doing a stall, like he's saying, the ball. The big thing for the stall is staying coordinated. So staying coordinated is essentially like stall. controlling this back end of this plane. If it's like all the way over here, that's uncoordinated. If it's all the way over here, it's uncoordinated. You want everything to kind of stay straight the whole so time. So what you're pushing, you're pushing your rudder back here to keep the nose straight when you're per, uh, performing the stall. So normally in the stall, you know, you, your nose might be up like this. And then once it quits producing lift, the nose drops like that. And then once it drops, it starts producing lift again. You're flying. But the so, point is what he's saying is looking outside. So when you're looking outside, you can tell like the nose will start to to move, right? And that'll tell you what inputs you need to make with the rudder. If you're staring at the ball, sometimes you're not looking outside. Looking outside is going to be more immediate, telling you what's happening with the plane. So you got to look outside to see the nose shifting to left or right and then kind of verify using your instruments. Less processing time than trying to read the instrument and do it with that yes. well, yeah. as opposed to just eyes to feet. Yeah, look at the look at the nose and if it's moving to the left, don't let it go to the left. Put in right rudder. Keep yeah, your nose this, straight. This window right here tells you everything you need to know. When you look out that window, you can see everything the plane's going to do. Yep. yep. The instruments are there for when you're in the clouds and you can't see. You know, you don't have any kind of reference. Yep. Yeah, the instruments are there for whenever it's hard to look out the window. <laughs> yes, when the window is blocked with something. What a lot of people do, too, when they go into the stall, I've, I've had a lot of people doing this recently, is like when they go out of the stall, well, when they stall, they'll put the nose down to recover, and then the nose will kick over to the left. But they're so focused on recovering that they don't see it, and that's a big part is holding your heading. So they'll let off on that rudder and the nose will kick over to the left. It's like, look at the nose. The nose is kicking over to the left. Don't let it kick over to the left because you're going to fail. When you recover and then you add in full power, you have uh, left turning tendencies. And that's why the the plane will go to the left. And so you're supposed to add in right rudder to keep it from doing that. And that's why you always say right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder. rudder, rudder, rudder. rudder. There's four left turning tendencies. <laughs> yeah. There's those, a bunch of them that make you turn left. And so. you see, and you see a lot of them whenever you're rolling down the runway, and um, the student won't be pushing right rudder, and they'll just start drifting off the runway to the to the left, and that's why I yell right rudder. Brennan, what are the four left turning tendencies? The four left turning tendencies are spiraling, slipstream, gyroscopic precession, p factor, and torque. But yeah, so like you feel those the most when you're at low air speeds and high power settings, which is why you feel it so much when you're going to take off because you're full power and at a slow speed and in a stall, 
usually it's power on stalls because you're going really slow and you're giving it full power. So that's why you need to watch your right left rudder, turning tendencies. Right rudder. Right rudder. Right, right rudder. rudder. And you usually have to say it so many times because the student's not listening to you when you say it one time. That's so. crazy, huh? Yeah. It is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy, huh? Yes. <laughs> you, no, I'm serious. Bro. Oh, like, no. you'll be in the plane with them, and you legit have to change the tone in your voice to get it through to them. I think I've said this on a podcast before. Like, when you're coming into land, you'll literally be, okay, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, right yeah, rudder. And right. then they're like, oh, right rudder. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, oh? No. <laughs> you didn't see it? Yeah. Now time for Today in Aviation History. July 31st, 1997, the first 737-800 flew. Cool. Launched. Launched. Took off. So what was the difference between like a normal 737 and that one? It's bigger. It's, it's just a little bit bigger. A bit longer. A bit, a bit longer. longer. It's got some more seats they can put in it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just a little bit bigger. July 31st, 1948. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I thought you were talking to the people on the camera. I didn't know. <laughs> July 31st, 1948, New York International Airport becomes the largest operational airport in the United States. And now the final approach. Um, Up, upcoming events. We we did the ATC meetup. That, I think that was the last time we talked, but that's already we, done. That was pretty good. We had a lot of people. Yep. I had a lot of people come. But we a, lot of, a lot of... ATC people showing up and showing out. Yeah. Teaching us some stuff about how to use runway one one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The I right mean, way. Yeah, they schooled us on uh using one one two nine. Yeah. Going the right direction. Yeah. And not, not using crossing it. over the runway. Yeah. And I didn't know it was that complicated. No. But it makes us it makes it makes it more efficient for us too. I mean, you know, we don't have to worry about traffic and holding and all that. Yeah. So make sure you land on it the long way and not the yeah not short the short way, way. Yeah. yeah long mm -hmm. yeah. yeah we hear some people do that yeah on the short side yeah hey yeah I didn't know it was a whole thing though like <coughs> if you're going to the north taking off on one one they gotta like vector you all the way out and stuff like that so don't do that don't use do the most that. efficient runway yes but the most efficient runway for us is one one so we're gonna use it yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not uh, a short, it's got a short taxi. Short, yeah. Short taxi. Bravo. 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 Bravo to 1-1. One, one. Yay! Bravo! Do your little thing. Huh? How do we end this thing? Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Life if you made it this far, you listened to the entire episode. And for that, we would just like to say thank you, and we hope you enjoyed it. We would also like to thank Brennan Go for being my co-host today. If you have any questions about today's episode or suggestions for future episodes, just leave a comment or message us, and we'll do our best to answer. If you'd like to check out some fun aviation videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel at Owens Flight Training. Or if you'd like to get more information on becoming a safe, knowledgeable, and confident pilot, just head over to our website, OwensFlightTraining.com. 